Now I want you to stand with me as we look in the book of Matthew, chapter number 1. We're going to go down to verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, and verse number 18. We stand in honor of God's word as the practice was back during the time of Nehemiah. Verse 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, that is, in a sexual manner, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, or privily. But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, this is Isaiah 7, 14, quote, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not, that is, in an intimate way, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called, he called, Joseph called his name Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Amen. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. We pray that you'll bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to read chapter 2, and then I want to dig into some things. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We notice the star lit behind us this morning. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Of course, Herod was troubled for political reasons. <laughs> he didn't want anybody else to dethrone him. A king with competition means he needs to get rid of him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He wanted to know, what do the prophets say? Where is he going to be born? Well, Micah 5, 2 says he'd be born in Bethlehem, right? And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, it's Micah, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of the, thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently. Pay attention to these words. This is important. Because we don't have the TV, you're not going to be able to follow me as easily. But if you have your Bible, I hope you're following, okay? He says, Diligently for the young child. Notice Matthew doesn't use the word babe. He uses the words young child, okay? And when, he, when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, not a stable, house, they saw the, third time, young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. That's the fifth time there. And when he rose, he took the young child, six time, and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, and that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Hosea, out of Egypt have I called my son. Just as Moses brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, Jesus brings us out of sin, and he came, brought us out of the darkness of Egypt, which represented the slavery of sin. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, 
You see the parallel of what happened during the time of Moses when they tried to kill all the male children of, of Israel. Now we have the slaughter then with Jesus. Think of it now. Look what's going on. The slaughter of babies today. Something, something spiritually, positively cataclysmic is about to happen. The second coming of the Messiah is being set. Amen. Let's read on. And in all the coast thereof, from two years of old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So the child then was not a babe at this point. Okay? Speculatively, perhaps up to two years of age here. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, or Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was, was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. The newer translation would say, because they are dead. The children are dead. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child, seventh time, and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, and for they are dead which sought the young child's life. So eight times in this chapter, young child is used. I think that that gives us extreme evidence in a court of law to say he wasn't a babe here. And come in, came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid that he would still have the same idea. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt into a city called Nazareth, that it also might fulfill the prophet, uh, spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Interesting information, isn't it? Let's dig into some of that this morning. Are you ready? We have a lot to talk about. To hit the ground running here, okay. I was hoping I could get into some of this last week, but uh, we'll pick up today the best we can with it. Amen. All right. Well, let's join as we jo uh, go a over a journey concerning the Christmas account of Matthew. Look at the Christmas account of Luke, and I'm not reading Luke this morning, but if you'll do some research yourself, you'll find that Matthew, ha in the first chapter, has a genealogy that he goes from Adam all the way up to Jesus. In the book of Luke. It takes from Joseph all the way back to Adam. But that's found in chapter 3 of Luke, not in the first chapter. So if you're looking for that, Luke would be chapter 3. And we're going to do some comparison here. Matthew's gospel is written from a Jew to Jews. Matthew is a Jew. Luke was a Gentile. If you don't already know it, Luke wrote the book of Acts as well, the history of the early church. And he writes to a guy named Theophilus. Okay? And I always make a joke about that because can you imagine naming your child Theophilus? That would be the awfulest name you could ever give them. <laughs> Never mind. The timeline is around A.D. 58 to 68. The comparison here is Matthew is a Jew, Luke's a Gentile. Matthew focuses on the male, not the female, Joseph. Luke focuses on the female because he's a physician and he talks about the mother and the condition and the birth and the baby. That's the way a doctor would do, right? Matthew is the genealogy from chapter 1. Genealogy is found in chapter 3 of Luke. The genealogy is uh, from Abraham to Joseph and Matthew. It's from Jesus back to Adam in, uh, in Luke's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, we see eight times, we've already read it in your hearing, that young child is used. And in Luke's gospel, babe is used twice in chapter 2, verses 12 and 16. In Matthew's gospel, we read about wise men. And uh, we, in Luke's gospel, we read about shepherds. In Matthew's gospel, we hear about Herod the Great. In Luke's gospel, we read about Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome. In Matthew's gospel, we read about a house. In Luke's gospel, we read about a manger, a feeding trough, which gives us the idea of a stable. Okay, so there's a lot of comparisons here. And it's important that we draw those understandings because tradition has painted for us a picture that I believe has been misunderstood. And even in pageants today, uh, we see, and you'll see tonight because it wants to get it all together, but you'll see it in different setting, but, and I think that they did a good job with being able to distinct the two because you're going to see a babe and then you'll see a young child. Amen? And that's the way it should be, biblically correct. Okay? In chapter 1 of Matthew's gospel that we read this morning, in verses 18 to the end of the chapter, Joseph and Mary are betrothed. That means engaged, espoused, they're to be married, but they had not yet come together and there was no sexual involvement between the two but yet she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that we read this, and to us this is endearing, uh, but as people that have never heard the gospel before, and somebody particularly at this time, that they had never seen anything like this before, can you imagine if your girlfriend comes up to you and says, hey, I know we're engaged, but I'm pregnant? 
And by the way, not by any man, it's by God himself. And the baby I'm going to have is going to be God. You know, you, you're going to be thinking, this is getting strange quick. In verse 19, Joseph is a righteous man, however. He's a, according to the Deuteronomy law of Moses, he had a right to, do, to separate himself now and, and re remove himself from the arrangement. But because he's a righteous, just man, he was going to put her away privately. In other words, do a, an official divorcement of, of sorts. And Mary, uh, he didn't want to disgrace her publicly to put her into shame. And he could have because, you know, a lot of that was about personal pride, to put people to shame because it made me look bad. But Joseph didn't care about his own image. He, he cared enough about Mary that even though he didn't understand, he was going to put her away privately. And then verse 20 of Matthew 1, the angel of the Lord confirms Mary's story to him. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have to, I'll be honest with you. If it was me, the angel of the Lord would have had to confirm the story to me too. Right? <laughs> How many of you men would agree with that assessment? The angel of the Lord would have to make sure that he, he I mean, <laughs> you know, Mary, I love you, but... <laughs> God's going to have to tell me that himself. Well, he did, okay? So the angel tells him in verse 20. Um, in verse 21 of Matthew 1, Jesus, in the, the name Jesus means the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all four letters capitalized, means Yahweh is salvation or the Lord who saves. Amen? Now, if there's any question about the deity of Jesus, it needs to be erased. Jesus Christ was no less than and is God. In verse 22 and 23, we see a quote of Isaiah 7, 14, Emmanuel. In Isaiah, it's spelled with an I. In the New Testament, the Greek from the translation, it's spelled with an E, but it means the same. It means God with us. That, that's a very clear definition, is it not? God with us. So Jesus wasn't a God with us. He wasn't a man who became God among us. He was God who became one of us. Amen? God with us. In verse 24 of Matthew 1, Joseph is obedient that's what he wants us to be. In verse 25, there's no sexual intercourse between Joseph and Mary until after the birth of Jesus. What does that bring? It brings integrity, it brings authenticity, and it brings credibility to the story in the sense of them being righteous people and also the, the, uh, the, the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So there is a clean wash here of the Scriptures that makes it clear to us that Jesus Christ was indeed the righteous, holy God among us. And these, these details are significant. This is not just some fairy tale. The, the details in this story are eternally significant. Are you listening to me? This is not just another story. This is God writing his story. And here's the question. Is there room in your heart for God to write his story in your life? In chapter 2, we see Herod the Great, who reigned around 37 B.C. to 4 A.D. And that's the period of time which Jesus was born. Right there at the early A.D.s. And by the way, if you don't know what those two mean, everybody knows what B.C. means, right? Before Christ. What does A.D. mean? Anno Domini. It means in the year of our Lord. So it doesn't mean after death. Some people have misunderstood it to say after death. But A.D. is Anno Domini, which, which means in the year of our Lord. So moving forward into throughout history, the one who created the world, the one who is history himself, who started humankind history by his creation, he steps into the realm of history as a human being in the space of time, and he splits time in half, reverses its calendar, and gives us a forward march rather than a reversal. Can I hear an amen? Which he does even spiritual. And even now, to this day, even when an atheist writes a date on a document, he's acknowledging the birth of Jesus Christ whether he recognizes it or not. Can I hear an amen? In the year of our Lord. This is very significant. We know Herod was a king who served by appointment by Roman Senate, so all he cared about was political prowess and power. He, was, he constructed the second temple that was, uh, uh, of course, uh, that was made by Solomon to begin with and then was destroyed and he reconstructed the temple. Uh, and so the people liked him because of the fact that he did that because they thought he was sympathetic to, his cause, or to their cause. The details of his life are recorded by a Roman Jewish historian named Josephus. He was tyrannical in his rule. He was power, power hungry. He was not a righteous man. Okay? As a matter of fact, Jesus even, I think, at one point called him an old fox. So, or at least the, the ruler of the time. You, you tell that old fox. 
But listen, Herod um, is somebody's power hungry. Now, the Magi, the word Magi, this is important. We use the word in the King James, wise men. And by the way, in the book of Daniel, mentioned 11 different times in the book of Daniel. And by the way, during the, the Eastern of the world, the Eastern uh, philosophy, that's where the wise men came from, right? From that region of the world. You get the picture. Modern day Iraq is this ancient Babylon. Did you know that? Okay. Even Saddam Hussein wanted to recreate Babylon. He wanted to be King Nebuchadnezzar all over again. But Daniel, and uh, we have Hanani, Azariah, and Mishael, which became uh, the, those are the Hebrew names, Shadrach, uh, and of course Abednego and Meshach, which were then the Babylonian names that were given to him. And Daniel had a Babylonian name given to him named Belteshazzar. We know that those guys lived during the time of some of these wise guys, I mean wise men. Okay? I tell, tell Jason, I said, he's a wise man in the, uh, in the pageant. I said, are you a wise guy or a wise man? <laughs> Just picking on him. But here's the interesting thing. The words wise men more accurately need to be called magi because it has to do with magic, soothsaying, and astrology. Everybody got that now? So they read the stars, so giving then creed to why they would follow a star. Okay? Mentioned 11 different times in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, verse 12, 18, and 24, verse two, two times in verse 24, also in verses 27 and 48 of chapter 2, and then chapter 4, verses 6 and 18, chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 15, we see 11 different times these guys are mentioned. Well, they're also, Jesus then is the righteous branch and descendant of uh, the uh, in Jeremiah 23, he's the righteous descendant that is talked about in the prophecies. And I wrote some of these prophecies down. And then, of course, he's the star from Jacob out of Numbers 24. He's Christ the morning star in 2 Peter 1, 19, the day star, the King James says. And then, and of course, Revelation 22 confirms himself as the offspring of David and the bride and the morning star. So we know Jesus then is born at this time, according to the prophecies, as the star that would be coming. Amen? You got that? So this star then appears. In verse 3 of chapter 2 of Matthew, Herod was disturbed because his reign was illegitimate. Herod did not want to lose his political position and power. In verse 4, Herod scurries to determine the birth of Jesus the Messiah, or the anointed one. The word Messiah is the same word. And I want everybody to get this, and I'm trying to move through this because if you want all this information, you're going to have to get the CD. You're just going to have to, or the video, because there's too much for you to be trying to write down, I'm sure. I wish I had about a whole month of Sunday sermons go through all this. But his, uh, Herod was uh, disturbed because this Messiah had been born. In Daniel 9.25 in the Old Testament, the word Messiah is used out of the Hebrew uh, from the, how it's translated. In the Greek, the word is Christ. But they both mean the same, the anointed one or the coming king. In chapter 2, verse 5 of Matthew, the Matthew then identifies Micah 5, 2 as that quote that he would be born in Bethlehem. Now, let me throw this out real quickly. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? First of all, naturally speaking, he was from uh, the house of Joseph, uh, the house of David, which Joseph descended from, and he would be born then because of the taxation or the census that was drawn every 14 years from the Romans. It drove them down into that region of the world, into Bethlehem, and they would be there at the exact pr precise time to be born during that census taking, and then he would be born in Bethlehem because the prophecy said he would be. But the reason he was born in Bethlehem is because Bethlehem means house of bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. Can I hear an amen? amen. So where else would the, the a bread be uh, brought but in the house of bread? Okay, now let's move on. In verse uh, 7 of Matthew 2, there's a private meeting with the, with the Magi. In verse 8, political maneuvering goes on because now he's saying, He's, he's using words to disguise himself here. Go search diligently for the young child that when you find him, I may go and worship him also. And so I can go out and put a dagger in him and kill him. I want to kill him. You know, politics can get brutal, can't it? It always has been. So don't think that's a new thing. In verse 9, we see the word young child, and we've already said it's used eight different times in that chapter. In verse 10, the, 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 the Magi were rejoicing because it could have been that they accomplished the fulfillment of their journey. I mean, these guys had traveled a long way. They didn't have a nice Dodge truck to drive or a Ford or a Chevrolet. They didn't have Burger King to stop and get lunch, and they didn't have a rest area to relieve themselves, you know. These guys had a hard travel, okay, probably dealing with different kinds of weather and having to take quite a bit of time to make this journey. 
And so they could have been just excited about the fact that they finally uh, had accomplished a journey and also the fulfillment of the prophecies because they were students of literature. Do you understand that? They were students of literature. If you know the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar wanted people around him, wise men that were great in aptitude, understanding that knew the lit literature of the time, spoke the language of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, and that looked really good and physically capable of handling things. He wanted to indoctrinate them with the philosophy of the Babylonians. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, none of those guys wanted to be indoctrinated with the philosophy of their time. You and I could learn a lesson from that. Can I hear an amen? We don't need to let the world indoctrinate us with its mess. We need to hear the Word of God and follow the Scriptures. Amen? Now, in verse number 11, we see the word young child again. And in verse 12, where he's warned, uh, the, the Magi are warned by God of Herod's intentions, so God is guiding the whole process. How many believe God guides the process of life in His sovereignty? Amen? Anybody? I'm so glad that I can trust that there's something bigger than me, someone bigger than me, someone named Jesus that's guiding the affairs of life. Amen. We can trust that as children of God. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The footsteps of a good man also are ordered by the Lord. Amen. And he delights in his way. Now, let's go to verse 13 of Matthew 2. Joseph is warned uh, not to go back. Uh, to that area, but he's warned to go over into Galilee. Verse 15, Moses delivered from slavery. Jesus delivers us from sin. In verse 16, the Herod kills the children two years of age and under. Verse 17 and 18, we see Jeremiah's prophecy. In verses 19 through 23, they move back to Israel and go to Nazareth, and there we see the deliverer. Now let's talk for just a moment about the three gifts that the Magi brought. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it's like Brother Tim says, but there's myrrh. Never mind. Gold was a valued commodity in the ancient world as well as our own today. How many of you think gold is valuable? How many of you know we used to build our financial system in America on the gold standard? We no longer do that because gold has the value to back it up, right? It's not inflated, right? Accumulation of gold was a measure of wealth. We see that in Genesis 13 and, uh, 2 and Ecclesiastes 2.8. Because of its scarcity and immense value, gold was particularly associated with royalty and nobility. We see a lot of this in the temple. Solomon had an ivory throne overlaid with gold. His horses ate out of troughs of gold. Isn't it interesting? I'm going to say that's what you call luxury to the nth degree, isn't it? And yet we complain about air-conditioned dog houses from the PTL days. Never mind. Let's move on. Interesting. Because of its scarcity, it was associated with royal ro royalty and nobility. The Queen of Sheba visits King Solomon uh, in 1 Kings 10 and bearing great quantities of gold as a gift. Amen, right? The wise men have, come, uh, have considered Jesus a king, royalty, nobility, so they bring him gold as the first one. Amen? How many of you recognize him as nobility and royalty? I'm so glad all of you agree with that. You're just so important. I mean, you, you encourage me up here. <laughs> the incarnation of Jesus shouted to the world the presence of God. Emmanuel has come to us. Just as the Holy of Holies in 1 Kings 6, 20 and 22, the walls were completely overlaid with gold. Jesus is the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, and deserves to have the gift of gold presented to him because he takes us into the presence of God. Can I hear an amen in the house of God? Frankincense. In the ancient Near East, the cost of frankincense, frankincense disallowed it from being used as a common household air freshener. How many of you like to use frankincense, stuff like that, as air freshener? Okay, it's a, the burning of this substance was closely associated with the ceremonial worship of a deity. Get this. The presentation of Jesus, or to Jesus, seems to indicate that the wise men recognizes him as deity. Could it be, now this is just for a considerable, uh, plausible and speculative opinion that the wise men themselves may have come to Christ as Lord themselves because they worshipped him. Wise men still worship him. And we turn from our philosophy, we turn from our Astrology. We turn from the indoctrination of the world and we come and bow at the feet of the only one that can save us. And his name is Jesus. Amen.
the presentation of Jesus seems to indicate that the wise men recognize him as deity. Burning incense in the tabernacle and temple was a key part of the sacrificial system in Exodus 30, verses 34 to 38. So, how many know Jesus has come to be the sacrifice for the world? Yeah! Somebody ought to get this. Somebody ought to be excited about it. Somebody ought to realize there's more in the story than what we've been told. We've been told we just hadn't got it. I hear Brother Corey Whitaker have been running that. They just don't get it, Bo. They just don't get it, Bo. Jesus is the sweet aroma that covers our sinful stench. He is the sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. In him, we are able then to offer a sweet-smelling savor of worship to God. You must come through Jesus Christ to have a sweet-smelling savor, or else you're a stench in the nostrils of God. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now let's talk about more. I mean, myrrh, myrrh. Myrrh is a fragrant uh, spice derived from the sap of a tree native to the Near East. Like frankincense, this can be used as incense, but in the ancient world, it had a wider usage as a perfume, an anointing oil, or medicinal tonic. With regard to Jesus, myrrh was a key ingredient in the mixture of spices that were used to prepare a body for burial. And we find that in John 19, verses 39 and 40. Royalty, sacrifice, burial. He was born as the king, God in human flesh, to die. He was headed to the cross before he was ever conceived. And we've got our focuses all wrong. Myrrh was a main ingredient in the anointing oil. Used to ceremonially prepare the priests. How many know Jesus is the high priest and profession of our faith? Amen. Yes. He's the only one. The instruments, the altar, and the temple, and what we know when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, that thick veil of curtains was rent from top to bottom, and God says, I'm stepping out to you. You no longer have to try to find your way into me. I, the high priest, have come, and now I'm going to step out of this place into your heart if you will receive me. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it wasn't under a tree, but hung on a tree for us. Jesus was a human, a human, and yet his humanity was also enveloped in his divinity. He was God and man at the same time. Amen? And his manner of saving his people was he came to die. The wealth of these items could have also been used for the escape into Bethlehem, or excuse me, from Bethlehem into Egypt, and the cost of living while they were there. In Matthew 2, verses 13 to 15, we read about that. And by the way, as I was listening to Rich Mullins, some of you, how many of you remember Rich Mullins? Rich Mullins, great uh, lyricist, uh, singer. Our God is an awesome God. Remember that one? Rich Mullins died tragically uh, many years back. Yeah, uh, too young in that sense. But he, him and the Ragamuffin Band did a song called My Deliverer's Coming. One day as I heard that song, I went, a lot, ding, and I went, wow, never saw that before. Jesus goes down into Egypt. Could it be that as a young child he walked beside the Nile and he heard the cries of all those babies that had been killed under the tyrannical leadership of the Pharaoh? Could it be he not only heard their cries, he heard the cries of the world. He heard the cries of the future people who would come and the cries of those children who would die even in our time under the guise of abortion. And he heard the cries of humanity, and he said, this is the reason I came. And he knew why he came into Egypt, so that he could take us and deliver us from bondage. He went down into Egypt, and he delivered the captives like Moses. At Moses' birth, Pharaoh had ordered the death of every male child in Exodus chapter 1. At Jesus' birth, Herod, the king, ordered the death of every male child two years of age and under in Matthew 2, verses 16 to 18. 
Jesus lived in Egypt until Herod's death. So you and I need to understand there's a lot more to the story here. By the first century A.D., the Magi were more broadly known as men who studied sacred writings and dabbled with occult practices. I mean, you need to turn from your sin and come to Christ and bow before him and worship him. Simon the sorcerer of Acts chapter 8 practiced magic. Perhaps he was from that lineage of the wise men. Magi were commonly associated with the Parthian Empire located to the east of Palestine, present-day Iran. If you know anything about the Persian Empire, you understand it is Persia is Iran. Babylon, Iraq. Ancient Babylon, ancient Persia, Iraq, Iran. Is there still not a lot of unrest going on in that part of the world? And do they not hate Israel? But our Savior is of Israel. Their Savior is of Israel. Amen. The world's Savior, if they come to him, the only way they're going to be saved is through him. Now let's read on. It is possible that the Magi, the wise men who visited the young child Jesus, came from this area. This would explain their familiarity with the Old Testament prophecies because they studied the literature about the king of the Jews. Daniel, who lived during the Babylonian captivity, oversaw these wise men. Did you not know that? Those people, he was the overseer. He was the top of the top, the valedictorian of his class. Daniel was the best of the best. If there's anybody I want to be like in the Old Testament, Daniel's certainly one of them. Amen? It's likely that Hebrew scriptures were among the sacred writings that these men studied. Could you imagine? Here's, pay attention to this. Here's Daniel. Here's uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. You have um, Shadrach, and you have Abednego and, Mish and, and uh, uh, Meshach, all three of those guys along with Daniel. We always say them with their... Babylonian names, but we never call Daniel by his Babylonian name. What's the difference? We, we, you see what I'm saying? We need to change that, don't we? But could it be that these guys, because they chose not to eat the food of the king for three years, listen, for ten days they tried them, but they decided not to be like them, that they impacted the wise men of their time, that they were then able to insert the gospel in the midst of that dark culture. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Because of the stand that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and excuse me, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. I'm still trying to train myself on that. They were able to then take them to the sacred writings of the Scripture, not the Chaldean cultural literature, so that the gospel, the prophecies, could be inducted in their hearts and minds so that it would affect them, impact them. And could it be that these magi were already followers of the Messiah before he, they ever went to him, but they wanted to find him because they'd been searching for him? Ah, yeah, this is good stuff. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's move on real quickly. I got just a little bit more time. I know we're going to have to get a quick lunch. Somebody go get it for me. Have it ready for me after the sermon if you don't. No, I'm just kidding. Now in Luke's account of the, of, of the birth of Jesus, by the way, let me just say this. Only two gospels record the birth of Jesus. All four of them record the, birth, I mean, excuse me, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. How many, did you got, how many of you got that? Only two of them talk about the birth. All four of them talk about the death, burial, resurrection. Which one do you think God wants us to focus on? Now, the birth is what gave opportunity and rise for the death, burial, resurrection to take place. However, he was not born to be epitomized as a baby. He was born for the purpose of dying as a, an adult on a cross and to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so the focus then was he was born to go to a cross and hang, hang on a tree. You get that? And that's very significant, so let's not over, overlook that. I learned that years ago as I was listening to Dr. David Jeremiah on the radio broadcast. I thought, man, that's good stuff. Luke is a physician. He's a historian. He's a Gentile. This guy takes a little bit different perspective. He's not a Jew, so he's not concerned necessarily about the male, although the Jew was, particularly like Matthew. He's concerned about the woman because she's the one having the baby. How many of you ladies say, I like Luke? I like Luke. He's concerned about us. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts in that order to Theophilus. We see that in Luke 1, 3 and Acts 1, 1. Theophilus was a friend of Luke. He is referred to as the most noble or excellent. You see that in Luke 1, 3. He may have been a statesman in high social standing compared to Acts 23, 26. Felix, a Roman governor uh, as well. The time uh, possibly A.D. 60s, 20 to 30 years after the death of Jesus. The Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, is in power in Luke 2. From January 
uh, 27 uh, B.C. Uh, to 14 A.D. Um, that's where we see 40 years or so, the Roman emperor. We also see Quirinius, which is uh, actually incorrect spelling uh, of the name in the King James where you say that it's actually Quirinius in the, the original language. Quirinius was uh, the, the governor of Syria, okay, not uh, Cyrenius. It was Quirinius. I just want to make sure we understood that as far as the, the translation process is concerned. We use the word, the King James uses the word taxed, but, and that is correct in the sense that how many know a census is for the purpose of taxation? If you don't know how many people there are, you don't know how many to send a bill to, right? Right? You got to know how many people there are so you can know how much taxes you can exact, right? The census then is to be taken every 14 years in verse 3 of Luke 2. In Galilee, in verse 4 of Luke 2, is in northern Israel. Judea, the southern mountainous Israel, in Micah 5, 2, is about 65 miles south of where they are. Now, here we are, nine months pregnant, ladies, and you're going to have to either walk or ride a donkey for 65 miles. How many of you ladies would appreciate being, honey, it's time to go to the hospital. Well, we better start 30 days ahead and get on the, let's get on the donkey and go 65 miles, okay? This, this had to be interesting, okay? Bethlehem is the house of bread. They're betrothed in verse 5 of Luke 2, but yet not married. In verse 6, Mary arrives at the time of her labor where she is great with child, the Scripture says. In other words, she's out there, right? Being great with child. Okay, you got it? How many of you ladies have been great with child? And you feel like... And, and may I say this, ladies, don't ever think down, uh, down on yourselves because to me, I think it's a beautiful thing to see a woman who's pregnant with a child. That's a beautiful thing to see because that means life. Amen? So don't ever look down on yourself about that. Now, the firstborn in verse 7 of Luke 2 is significant. Naturally speaking, Mary is the first child. Uh, excuse me, Mary, excuse me. Mary's first child is the firstborn. The firstborn son is a significant thing to a Jewish family, Right? And this child was to be circumcised. The first son of a father, and by the way, Jesus is God's only begotten son. Can I hear an amen? amen. Mary and God didn't have an, an eternal, in a heavenly relationship and her get pregnant. No. How many know there's no heavenly mother? Let me say that again. There is no heavenly mother. There was an earthly mother, but there is a heavenly father. Do you understand what I'm talking about? God who became a man. Got it? See, so he, he used the woman as a human being, implanted the seed of himself in that child by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, conceived Christ as a human being person so that he would then be born in, uh, of the virgin. I believe in the virgin birth. How many of you say amen to that? Let me just go ahead and make one further statement. I believe if you don't believe in the birth, a virgin birth of Jesus, you have just tainted the whole process. It makes it completely irrelevant. I heard a preacher say one time, I don't believe it's necessary for you to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus to be saved. And I went, <laughs> I said, I can understand what you're trying to say if somebody don't understand it all, but I'm not going to listen to you anymore. <laughs> so anyway, I never listened to him again. You can't mess with that kind of stuff, right? Can I hear an amen? amen? I believe that Jesus was God in human flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, rose again, he's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we should never compromise that. In John 3, where we see God gave forth His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. We see the same thing in verse 18 of John 3. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not has been condemned already, for he does not believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. We see in that also in John chapter 1, verse 1, where in the beginning God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Greek, the Greek word proto, uh, prototokos, which means first begotten, is firstborn in many translations. Metaphorically, this is used to express the connection as God becoming a human being before, excuse me, being born as a human man. Adam, as a Hebrew word, pay attention to this, the word Adam in the Hebrew means man, first blood. Did you know that? Jesus was man, 
first and only blood that can save. If you want to be a man, men, act like Jesus, not like you. Uh-huh. You want to act like a man, you need to act like Jesus. You're not a man until you act like Jesus. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care what sports you play or how successful you've been, how much money you made. Until you act like Jesus, you're not a man. Amen. They put him in swaddling clothes in Luke 2. Narrow bands of cloth wrapped around a newborn to restrain movement, to warm them, and to keep them quiet. Because when the baby feels snuggled, they feel like they can be quiet, right? This was Mary's way of keeping baby Jesus safe and warm. And that's what a mama does. I've got to take care of God. I've got to make sure I don't get up. Come on, I'm being. Can you imagine taking care of God? Can you imagine what Mary's pondering? Did she understand all this? I'm sure she was struggling with trying to wrap her mind around all this, right? And she's probably thinking, now, did I hear that angel right? You know, is this really happening? I mean, how many of you have sometimes questions and doubts about even your own walk with God and your, your salvation and things of that nature? The enemy comes in and tries to make you doubt. It's human nature. This could be the symbolic of Jesus' death, that is, the swaddling clothes, because he would die and be wrapped and laid in a tomb, especially when coupled with the idea that myrrh presented by the Magi in John 19. Now, the manger is an in interesting thing. And there's debate about the word manger. Matter of fact, in the rehearsal the other night, he kept calling it a manger instead of a stable. But I think it's, the, it's a moot point. Manger is an open box, a feeding trough by which animals come to feed. I'm glad that the bread of life was laid in a manger so that all that come to him can eat of him and live. Can I hear an amen? amen. The other thing is, if he was born in a stable, which if he's laid in a manger, people want to argue whether it was a house or stable. I have to say my opinion is stable because you don't put a manger in a house you put a manger in a stable because the manger is where animals feed correct so i think we can deduce from that logically and reasonably that he was born in a stable right now why would jesus be born in a stable and be turned away from the end we think could he have not at least stayed at a five-star hotel come on this is jesus this is god in human flesh why do we got to put god in a manger right well here's the reason he was a lamb he was a human being, but he was born as the Lamb of God. You don't want a, a lamb born inside a house. You want a lamb born in a stable because he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And who do you tell about the birth of a lamb? When a lamb comes, you don't go to the aristocrats of Rome and you don't go to the religious elite of Jerusalem. Who do you go tell about the birth of a lamb? Shepherds, you got it. Now you're being, yeah, yeah, it's coming together, isn't it? So now the angels go tell the shepherds about the birth of the lamb. And you know what the word pastor means? It means shepherd, and shepherds have been heralding the story ever since. Amen. Let's move on. I'm going to have to bring this to a close in a moment. An open feeding box trough used by animals to feed. In the Greek, it's phatene, P-H-A-T-N-E. It, it, it means a stall. Perhaps a crib to feed cattle, the ledge or projection in the end of a room used as a stall on which hay or other food or animals would be placed. I mean, have you ever been in a, uh, to feed cows and you put the hay in this manger-like thing to be able to feed them? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. So Jesus is the bread, the manna from heaven. In John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. Amen. Unless you eat of me and drink of my blood, you cannot have any part with me. And the Bible said, many of them said, this is a hard saying. We turn and walk no more with him. He said, will you leave me also? I believe what the world thinks to be impossible. Because the God of possibilities is able to erase the impossibilities. We are lambs ourselves. In fact, Peter was told by Jesus, feed my lambs. First one in John 21. Second time, feed my sheep. Third time, feed my sheep. In 1 Peter 5, he says, feed the flock of God. He never forgot that we were lambs of God. Can I hear an amen? So the shepherd and bishop of our souls became the lamb of God, which you trace all the way back to Genesis 22, where God will provide himself a lamb. God did provide himself as the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So Abraham didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. God sacrificed his son for us. Amen. Talk about no room in the inn. Let me ask you the question, is there room in your heart for Christ? The shepherds were lamb and sheep caretakers. 
They particularly wanted to look after the lambs. How I many know? Because the lambs are young, vulnerable, and the wolves want them real bad, right? We too need to be guarding those young believers in Christ, right? Discipling them and shrouding them, correct, cr caressing them, caring for them. Church, what are we supposed to be doing? Just coming to church, okay, I got what I wanted. I ate my part at the trough. See you guys next week. No, you're supposed to help take care of the flock. Because listen, when the flock, pay attention to this, when the flock stays together, the wolf has much smaller chances of injuring or killing one of us. But when you stray from the, listen to me, when you stray from the flock, you become an open prey to the devil. Let me just tell you, some of you very clearly today, you need to be in church. You need to be in church regularly. And I'm going to tell you something that's a pet peeve of mine. I've, I've said, I was driving by on the way to church this morning, and I saw a man and wife that I don't know has ever been to church since I've known them on a Sunday morning. Perhaps they have, but not here. And I said to myself, I said, God, I don't understand why people don't want to go to church. I don't understand. It's not, and I know I've been, I, listen, I, was, I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church all the time. And it got me addicted. Thank God I got addicted to it. I developed a dependency. And I can't help but want to go to church. And there's nothing that I'd rather do on a Sunday than get up and go to church. I don't want to watch TV. I don't want to go to Walmart. I don't want to go somewhere else because I love Jesus. I'm not a professed Christian. I am a Christian. So stop saying you are. Act like one. Find yourself in the flock regularly. And don't you realize how much it breaks my heart and breaks his heart when you're not? Because you're not getting the feed from the trough. Now, I understand people say, well, I can eat personally. I understand that. But there's something about the family of God coming to the table. And there's something about the dinner, family dinner table that's special. How many of you like to eat by yourself? Let me see your hands. Somebody said, I just like to eat. I'll eat either way. But, I mean, no, it's special when you've got family together how many of you ladies like to make a meal and somebody says, mm, man, these potatoes are good. <laughs> I believe I have a second or a third helping of those things. <laughs> yeah, pass the potatoes if you don't. You know, it's like, yeah, I did a good job on that one. Amen, you know. There's something special about eating at a table. Will you come to his table? He came to a stable to provide a table and a place for you. As I bring this to a close, the angel of the Lord gave the announcement of the supernatural birth of Christ, and you and I have been given the responsibility as the epistles have been written to us, the gospel has been given to us, the story has been handed down to us. We have a responsibility to carry it on into our time and to future generations. Will the next generation understand the story? I'm afraid that many of them do not. And I'm just going to be frank with you here. We give our kids all these gifts. But how many of you are even going to read this, the scripture story with your family this Christmas? And let me ask you, is that not a sin to give all this stuff and not talk about the one it's about? How would you feel if you gave your son to die for somebody and they all they did was gather together and give presents about it? It should get quiet in here. We have spoiled our children to the nth degree. As adults, we have way too much stuff. And we think it's our right to have it. Well, let me just say, if I got everything and don't have Jesus, I have nothing. But if I have Christ and I have nothing else, I have everything. So if you have all the stuff of life, remember the one that gave that to you. But I pray more importantly you have the stuff of life because that all that other stuff's just going whew, gone but when you have christ you have eternal life and here's the last question i'm going to ask you do you have room in your life for jesus to inconvenience you what if he just comes in the middle of the night and glory to god in the highest what what, oh, what? <laughs> lord don't you know it's 2 a.m i'm trying to sleep here and he disrupts your life, inconveniences you. Are you available? Or are you just too stringent about, hey, 
I got tunnel vision. I've got goals to accomplish. I got things I got to get done. A to do list. I got president. Are you going to just say, there's room in my heart for Christ? Not just intellectually, but practically every day in every way. Amen. I want you to bow your heads for me.